Hi, and welcome to the 37th in our Middle Eastern Islamic History series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Assyrians and a little bit about the Kurds. Um, and so for those who are familiar, um, permit me to talk about the rules. The first, this is not an academic presentation. I am not accredited in history, philosophy, religion, or any of the subjects that we will be tackling today. I'm just a lay person presenting uh, this kind of history. And despite the fact that there are certainly religious elements to what I'm going to be presenting, I'm gonna try and do so from a secular perspective. So the next thing is that given the sensitivity of all these topics, I urge you to be respectful. But that said, um, I love interactivity. Questions, comments, clarifications, please put those in the chat. I do read the chat as I do the presentation and I will respond to your questions in due course. Um, and what I like to say is that these presentations, these classes are a 101 and a 201. And what I mean by that is that if you don't know anything, I'll catch you up. And if you already knew something on the topic, that's fantastic. I'll probably tell you something I didn't know that you didn't know. Um, when I put dates below a person, those are their dates that they served in whatever role they had. If they were king, if they were pharaoh, if they were uh, you know, general in the military, um, those dates are their years of service, not when they were born and died. I also have uh, what I call a two hour hard stop, which means that whatever slide we're on, if we didn't get to everything I wanted to cover tonight, that's okay. Uh, we'll stop there, and um, we may continue a discussion, but there's no new information. You won't miss anything uh, if you don't want to stay all two hours, or beyond, beyond those two hours, sorry. Um, and finally, like all other entries to the Middle Eastern History series, this entry is recorded. Um, you can watch it later. Sorry, it will be recorded. You can watch it later. And all the other entries, the other 36 entries are there, as well as numerous other series that have been conducted uh, as part of the sister group series on Rome, series on um, modern European Union, mod the, yeah, the modern European Union, um, series about ancient Greece, um, all kinds of uh, different things uh, we've covered. And we have so many new events uh, in the future. But everybody's favorite part, show the continuity between the various episodes, the quiz to see what you remember from last time. So question one, which of the following best characterizes Fath Ali Shah's approach to leading uh, Persia? Is it A, he embarked on a large scale militarization of Persia, leading a Persian national army like that of Nether Shah on a cross Caucasus raid to challenge the Russians? B, he maintained a coterie of British, French, and Russian representatives in his court who advised on almost all aspects of policy. C, he used traditional Persian administration, giving power to autonomous local rulers and avoiding conflict, creating relative peace and prosperity. D, he was a Persian ethno-nationalist, forcing Turkic, Kurdish, Lurish, Arab, and other minorities to speak Persian, combining this with support for France and Egypt internationally. Any guesses in the chat? All right, the answer is C. He used traditional Persian administration giving power to autonomous local rulers. Now, the, uh, this was uh, one of the weaknesses of Fath Ali Shah's empire was that it couldn't bring together all of the different parts of Persia into one cohesive unit. But the general idea that had been learned from Nader Shah's experiment in the 18th century was that you really couldn't do this without draining the treasury and leveling oppressive taxes. And so Fat Ali Shah um, refused to unify the country. Now, he did have alliances with the British, French, and Russians um, at different points. Um, actually, not with the Russians. The Russians will come later. Um, the British and the French. But he would expel the uh, ambassadors of one if the other uh, signed a treaty with him. And finally, uh, the Persian ethno-nationalist, that would be uh, Reza Pahlavi Shah, and that's more in the 20th century. 
Question number two. Which of the following best characterizes the Anglo-Iranian alliance in the 19th century? A. The British saw the expansion of French influence in Egypt and the Ottoman Empire as a direct threat to its power and provided weapons and arms to Persia without reservation. B. Fatah Ali Shah actively sought out the British to perform joint raids on Central Asia and exact retribution on the Afghan Emirate, Khiva, and Bukhara. C. The alliance was a paper treaty that had no real political consequences, with both the British and the Persians stopping correspondence soon after. D. The British alliance with the Persians was predicated on larger threats in the British world, such as Napoleon or possible invasions of India, making the alliance fickle for Persia. So we've got two people for D, and D is exactly correct. Um, during this period, um, the Persians really sought help in fighting the Russians, but the British were much more concerned with Napoleon and invasions of India. So whenever Russia happened to be on the same side of the Napoleonic Wars as the British were, um, the British really uh, toned down the level of commitment that they would do um, in helping the Persians uh, defeat the Russians. Um, the French did expand their influence in Egypt, but the British expanded their influence in the Ottoman Empire, which is why A is wrong. Um, B um, refers more to the reign of Muhammad Shah than Fatah Ali Shah, um, and, uh, but he didn't uh, work with the British to form joint raids. In fact, the British opposed um, Muhammad Shah's raids into Afghanistan against the Afghan Emirate. Um, and C is false. The British did provide uh, military assistance. We remember, for example, the uh, British were sending military advisors during uh, the Persian uh, war uh, against the Russians from 1804 to 1813, uh, in particular at the Battle of Sultanabad, um, where British military uh, assistance really was the tipping point, which led to a Persian victory in that battle. Question number three. Which of the following battles were Russian victories in the Caucasus Wars? Choose all that apply. Ganja in 1804, Sultanabad in 1812, Aslanduz in 1812, Lankaran in 1813, Ganja in 1826, and Erivan in 1827. All right, um, I guess, um, so A, C, D, and F were all Russian victories, and E is a Russian victory if we're talking about the Battle of Ganja in 1826 as opposed to the taking of Ganja in 1826, because um, the, the Persians were able to just walk into the city in 1826. There were large rebellions against Yermolov and the Russian control of the city. Um, and the Persians were able to just take it uh, without fighting for it, but the Russians then were able to besiege the city and take it later in the year, um, and so that was a Russian victory. So um, all except Sultanabad were Russian victories. Aslanduz and Lenkran, particularly uh, grisly ones for the Persians. Question number four. Which three of the following statements about the Baha'i faith are true? A. The Baha'i have a prophet, the Baha'u'llah, who wrote that he is the gateway to the divine, abrogating the Islamic view of Muhammad being the final prophet. B, the Baha'i have a structured international clergy and regional leadership that the Baha'i faithful are supposed to emulate, like the Maja'i Taqlid. C, the Baha'i argued strenuously for women's rights, leading to a rejection of the hijab. D, the Baha'i said that there should be government imposed limits on wealth and poverty. E, the Baha'i argued that uh, Ali was a divinity operating in duality with Allah, earning the religion the nickname Ali Ilahi. F, it was strongly supported by the Qajar dynasty and led to a revolt by the ulama. G, the Baha'i emphatically reject the Baltiniya of Shiite Islam and promote a Zahiri view.
which three of these are true? Any guesses in the comments? We've got A, B, and C. A and C are both correct. B is actually false. Um, the Baha'i rejected the structure of large-scale international clergy. And the Marja'i Taqlid is an institution of 12 years Shiite Islam. The other correct answer actually is D. Um, Baha'u'llah um, said that the government should prevent people from becoming too wealthy and uh, prevent people from becoming too poor. Uh, he wasn't a socialist in the sense of he didn't believe in a redistribution mechanism necessarily, but he believed that the government should prevent these kinds of eventualities. Um, D is, uh, sorry, E is false um, because uh, the Baha'i did not uh, create an equivalence between Ali and God. Um, that's a number of other faiths, um, especially the Kurdish faith, Yarsani. Um, F, it was strongly opposed by the uh, ulama, in the Qajar dynasty, and the Qajar government was uh, based on the ulema, um, used them for tactical support, so they couldn't uh, they couldn't have endorsed something like this. And G is false because the Baltini view of Shiite Islam is further enhanced and built upon within the uh, within the understanding of the Baha'i, not rejected. All right, question number five. All the following except which explain why Amir Kabir could not modernize Persia. A, the British and Russian pressure was decidedly against Amir Kabir's infrastructural improvements, persuading the Shah to oppose them. B, leaders among the Shiite ulama reiterated uh, that uh, Western reforms like the Darul Fanun Polytechnic School were anti-Islamic. C, famines caused by his agrarian reforms resulted in wide-scale public revolts against his changes and developments. And D, the loans undertaken both to fund the new factory construction, military modernization, and other reforms on top of Nasruddin Shah's expensive tastes exploded the debt. Which of the following, I'm oh, sorry, all the following except which of the uh, which answer um, explain why Amir Kabir could not modernize Persia? All right, the answer is C. So uh, the other ones are all things that uh, caused his ruin and he was removed within three years of coming to power. Um, but even though he instituted agrarian reforms, they did not cause famines. Okay, so what we're here to talk about today is the situation in Northern Mesopotamia. Predominantly that's in the country of Iraq. Some of it spills over into Syria and into Turkey. And so we've got uh, this territory called the Jazeera, um, meaning the island in Arabic. And the Jazeera refers to that area between uh, the Tigris River and some of the tributaries of the Tigris River. So if you look at the map on the right-hand side, you can see the Tigris River moving north from Baghdad through the cities of Samarra and Tikrit before entering into northern Iraq. And you can see uh, following the provincial borders, there are tributaries that feed into the Tigris River, like the Great Zab, Greater Zab, the Lesser Zab, and several other rivers. We'll look more in depth than on another map. But what's important to notice is that once we get into these areas, especially that are more mountainous and higher up in the river valley, we have a complete shift in the ethnic character uh, of these regions. So we can see for example, pretty much the rest of Iraq is Arab majority, but we've got Kurds, Assyrians, Armenians, and, and small pockets, and Turkmens. Um, Turkmens are uh, similar to the Turkish people of Anatolia. They're not connected to the people of Turkmenistan, um, despite having the same name. So now each of the Assyrians, uh, the top picture is of Assyrians in their traditional clothing, and the bottom picture is of Kurds in their traditional clothing. As you can see, the traditional clothings are rather similar. And one of the points that's worth making is that hair is typically exposed on women, right? Uh, this is in contrast to um, more typical Islamic garb, 
where the woman's hair is covered completely. Um, and you can also see uh, that the traditional garments differ from region to region, which is why you have all these different kinds of dresses for women um, in these large parades or, or gatherings because they represent many different regions um, across the uh, across north uh, yeah across northern Iraq. Now, another thing to point out is that some of these groups are ethnicities. Some of them are ethno-religious groups. Some of them are um, yeah. Uh, some of them are ethnicities, and some of them are ethno-religious groups. And that distinction is very important to make. An ethnicity is a group that's defined primarily by language, history, culture that they share in common, but an ethnicity can have many different religions within it. An ethno-religious group is a group that is defined by both their religion and their ethnic character. A good example for those in the West would be the Jews, right? Uh, the Jews have a specific religion that is unique to them. And at the same time, they constitute somehow um, in, uh, a nation in the way that the Italians or the Germans or the French also constitute a nation. So. Ethno-religious groups have a unique permeability, right? Because a person can convert to a religion, um, generally speaking, that the ethno-religious believe in. There are some exceptions. Some ethno-religions are what are called closed. You cannot convert to them. Um, but in most cases, the conversion process is very difficult. So it's semi-permeable, but it's not very, but it's not as permeable as the general converting religions, such as. Christianity writ large, Islam writ large. And so these ethno-religious groups have that fusion of a religion or a set of acceptable variations on that religion and um, an ethnic character that has something to do with language, something to do with national identity, something to do with tribalism, um, and that sort of fuses together. The Kurds, in terms of uh, that uh, their character, their character is exclusively ethnic. There are numerous different Kurdish religions. Most Kurds today are Sunni Muslim, but there are minorities of Kurds in a number of different other faiths. Um, probably the most famous one uh, on the news recently are the Yazidi. Uh, Yazidi is an indigenous Kurdish faith um, that is uh, uh, we actually don't know how old it is, but it's at least 2,000 years old. It is derived in a certain sense from Zoroastrianism, uh, but it is not Zoroastrianism per se. There are, and the Yazidi faith, uh, we'll talk about it more uh, next time, um, is really predicated um, on the worship of Melik Taos, um, a peacock demon um, who was expelled from uh, was expelled from heaven, but then through acts of contrition and repentance was able to earn God's favor once again. And that journey of um, that journey of repentance, that journey of self deliverance, is what the Yazidi find worth emulating about this Melek Taos, about this uh, peacock demon. Um, there are other uh, religions that are um, more in line with Islam or uh, an Islamic basis. There are Shiite Kurds, especially the Faili Kurds. Um, and from the Shiite Kurds arose a number of other uh, more recent faiths, uh, such as Yarsani or Ahl al uh, Both of those two are names for the same religion. And that religion tends to be a very strongly Baltini or very strongly um, interpretationalist uh, view that has moved beyond uh, what Shiite Islam says explicitly and gone into uh, new interpretations of the relationship between Ali, uh, Muhammad's cousin, uh, and God. Another religion that's very popular among the Kurds is what's called Alevism. And the Alevi um, are a Shiite Sufi tradition um, that broke off from uh, Shiism and began to have its own organization um, uh, led by what were called peer or um, local teachers. And those teachers would promote the tradition uh, to those that followed them. 
Again, this is a very heavily Baltini tradition, one that really focuses on the secret spiritual meaning um, in reality. And so um, because of this religious diversity uh, in the Kurdish population, you have to a certain degree, a greater acceptance of religious diversity among Kurds themselves. That's not to, uh, but many people confuse this acceptance of religious diversity for necessarily being modern. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, within Turkey, Kurds may be more moderate than the Turks that neighbor them, but are certainly not as westernized as the Turks who live in Izmir or Istanbul. So there, uh, there is a certain degree of um, non-conflation that we should undo. Um, so when we talk about this Jazeera region, right, we're talking about this region in the northern part of Iraq, and I've sort of zoomed in on it in the upper left-hand side, and you can see uh, several of the rivers. You can see the small, the lesser Zab, um, and then north of it, you can see the greater Zab, and then even further north, you can see the Khabur. Um, and all of these rivers occur just coming off of the northern Zagros and southern Taurus plateaus. Those plateaus really serve as the water sources for the Tigris River. Further west, the Euphrates River has its sources in the Armenian plateau. And there are a number of tributaries of the Armenian, uh, sorry, of the Euphrates River that come from the Armenian plateau uh, through what's today western, sorry, through today what's eastern Syria uh, and joining up with the Euphrates. But this historic Jazeera region um, is very different from a lot of the rest of Iraq. And it's different for two major reasons. The first one is that it receives quite plentiful amounts of rainfall. It's still a semi-arid climate. Um, so it's not uh, a jungle, as is the case in certain parts on the eastern side of the Iranian plateau, like we talked about uh, two weeks ago. But uh, it does have enough water um, for herding and shepherding to be a dominant form of sustenance in the region. The second one is that because there are so many rivers, um, it's uh, and the elevation is significantly higher, these areas are much more defensible and much more prone to having small city-states develop uh, because they can't just be attacked on the flatter territory that exists lower in the Tigris and Euphrates River valleys. So then it comes to the question of language. So most of the groups in the Middle East today speak languages from one of two branches. Uh, one is the Semitic branch in the Afroasiatic tree, and the other is from the Indo-Iranian um, uh, branch of the Indo-European tree um, or the related Armenian branch. Of course, the third one is Turkic languages, um, but those came much later in history um, because as we remember, uh, the real Turkic push into the Middle East came about a thousand years ago um, around the time of the Battle of Dun Dun Khan, which was uh, 1040 CE. So when we're tracking the development of the Assyrian people from the ancient period until today, we notice that there are sort of three different periods of Assyrian language that exist. The first one is the ancient period. And you can see on the, on the time scale that that goes from roughly 2000 BC, a little bit uh, before that, and sort of uh, dies out around 600 BCE. Now, this form of Assyrian is a dialect of Akkadian, Akkadian being that first Semitic language uh, put to a read and stylus, uh, read stylus on, on clay tablet um, at the very beginning of Sumeria. It's worth pointing out that the Sumerian language is completely unrelated to Akkadian. The Sumerian language, um, there are debates as to where to place it on the language family tree but it seems to be more similar to Uralic languages, languages like Hungarian um, and Finnish, uh, than it does to any Middle Eastern language today. So 
Akkadian became the dominant language when you started having large-scale empires like that for, founded by Sargon of Akkad. And so the Assyrian language as a dialect of Akkadian became the dominant language of Assyria. Now that starts to change midway through the Neo-Assyrian period, which begins around 900 BCE. And at that point, we start having a very interesting shift occur. The Arameans, and for reasons we're going to discuss, uh, this happens. The Arameans and their language of Aramaic, which is a very distant relative um, of Assyrian, it wasn't a language that would have been mutually intelligible. So uh, think English and German. Um, if you, or probably English and Russian is probably better uh, thought process because there is some relation, but they're very distinct from one another. And these Aramaic languages spoken by the Arameans became the common everyday language of the Assyrian people. And we start to see this in a number of the written documents that they use, that they're using Aramaic um, in order to say what they want to say. Um, but uh, official documents are still being written in the Akkadian dialect of Assyria. We see a shift though, moving towards 700 and 600 uh, BCE, where we see more and more official texts actually being written in Aramaic as, as opposed to being written in the Assyrian dialect of Akkadian. That dialect of Aramaic persists and goes through a number of different changes as time moves forward. In the same way that, for example, we have Old English, Middle English, and Modern English, where Old English um, is incomprehensible to Modern English speakers, Middle English uh, takes a little bit uh, to understand, and Modern English, of course, is the language we speak now, um, Aramaic went through these same kinds of developments. So you can see in that central branch, you have Aramaic really um, beginning to be recognized and written about 900 BCE. And then we shift um, into a Syriac period around, um, the, uh, around the beginning of the Common Era and continuing until roughly 500, uh, 600, 700 CE. And Syriac was a stylized form of uh, Middle Aramaic, we can say, right? If the first is the Old Aramaic, this is now Middle Aramaic. And Syriac in turn, as the common language of the Assyrian people, has decayed into a number of dialects. And those dialects are their own separate and unique languages. Um, there is a number of, there is a lot of crossover between those dialects, but you can see on the map on the left-hand side that they divide into the um, Turioya dialect, the Nineveh Plains dialect, um, and the um, Asiro, uh, yeah, Ashiret uh, dialect. So these three dialects are all related to each other and are relatively intelligible. Um, they're uh, you, I guess the right equivalent to think about it would be um, the intelligibility between, let's say, Jamaican Patois and English, right? And so there is a degree where communication is possible, but it's not enough where messages pass through seamlessly. Then in the city of Ma'lula, um, close to the Syrian border with Lebanon, um, we have a distinct dialect of Aramaic that has survived. Um, and that dialect is very different um, from the other dialects. And you can see that sort of separation um, uh, on, the, on the graph where Mahlula is put separate from Turioya. Okay. And if we dig in more to the Assyrian languages and writing style, one of the things that uh, begins to develop is that when the Assyrians were writing uh, their dialect of Akkadian, they were using cuneiform, but they weren't using cuneiform as an ideographic system, which is how it was invented, right? Originally, uh, those wedges would be, would be put together uh, in the configurations you see, and those configurations would mean something. Uh, you can see, for example, on the lower right-hand side, you have Ashur, um, 
which is the name of the capital of Assyria. In fact, that's where the name Assyria comes from, Ashur. And those wedges put together are that entire idea. The same way that if I write the number two uh, as a single um, figure, right, that symbol has no T in it. It has no U written in it. But we understand that symbol to mean two, and that's what an idea graph is. It, rep it, it represents an idea in a way that doesn't look anything like the idea it's representing or the sounds that are required to make it. And what the Assyrians did to this idea graphic system is that they turned it into a syllabary. So they would use the word that these idea graphs represented, take the first syllable, and then uh, you can put it together. So, right? So, if I wanted to write something in that Akkadian dialect, sorry, that Assyrian dialect of Akkadian, and I wanted to write, for example, I don't know, ba shun, I would take that ba and I would take that shun and I would put them together um, and I would have ba shun, right? Um, but this violates the idea graphic system because of course if i wanted to say um i don't know two five right and i put the two and i put the five and i read that as two five um it doesn't carry the meaning of 25 anymore right the the actual meaning of the idea graphs um is stripped from them and that's how the akkadian dialect was written one of the difficulties, of course, is that as a syllabary, it doesn't necessarily contour exactly to the way Assyrian Aramaic, sorry, Assyrian, I'm sorry, the Akkadian dialect, the, the Assyrian dialect of Akkadian was spoken. Um, it would have additional vowels or additional consonants if those were the syllables that they had at their disposal. So sometimes reconstructing the way something would sound is a little difficult. Assyrian Aramaic um, as a language began to develop its own alphabet based first on um, the, uh, the Phoenician alphabet through the Hebrew alphabet. Now you can see the Aramaic letters in the upper, uh, in the upper line. For those who are familiar with Hebrew, um, those letters look extremely familiar as uh, variations of the modern Hebrew alphabet, but there are some distinctions that are worth pointing out. The first one is the letters with the degesh or the dot in the middle. In modern Hebrew, um, several of the letters that are represented do not change in terms of pronunciation when they take a degesh, um, but in Aramaic, they all do, um, which results in distinct sounds. That said, the Aram uh, Aramaic speakers, um, especially the Christian Assyrians, by the time the Peshitta was written, which is around 200 uh, CE, the Assyrians had their own uh, letters, their own Syriac alphabet. And in fact, they have three different Syriac alphabets that are all parallel. Um, you can see in the upper left-hand side, you have the Sartu alphabet, you have the Mathnahaya alphabet, and the Estrangela alphabet. Estrangela is probably the most common uh, to see. Serto is the most common in online forums in terms of texting and emails. Um, Estrangela is much more common in typed uh, things like a newspaper, for example, or a book. Madnahaya, I've only seen in religious contexts. Now, all three of those are the same sentence. So you can see there's actually quite a difference in some of the letters. In particular, the letter Aleph, you can see in the Estrangela, looks sort of like uh, a man with his hand, uh, actually. You can see the Aleph here in the Estrangela, and it looks sort of like a man with his hand down on the ground looking up. But you can also see the Aleph here in the Matnahaya and here in the Sirto, where it's more of a straight line. And for those who are familiar with Arabic, you can see the similarity there. Um, and this, of course, is the line Breshit Itau Hua Melta, meaning uh, in the beginning was the word. 
um, the first line of the book of John. All right. In terms of Kurds, Kurds fit on the Indo-European language family tree. And uh, we can see that uh, tree uh, in this picture. Um, and they are off on that little Indo-Iranian branch um, where they sit with roughly 16 million speakers across, uh, sorry, 30 million speakers across the different dialects or languages of Kurdish. Now it's difficult to determine from a presentation point of view, whether I should say that Kurdish is one language with many dialects or multiple languages. Um, from a linguistic standpoint, it's not difficult at all. Uh, there are multiple Kurdish languages. That said, the Kurds, because of their aspirations in terms of a national identity, um, are very adamant that they speak one language, despite the fact that by every linguistic standard, their languages are quite distinct. And those standards come in two forms. The first one is that if two systems of speech have different forms of writing, according to linguistics, that is a different language, regardless of the level of intelligibility. So for example, Dutch and German are very similar to each other. And most people who speak Dutch can understand German. Most people who speak German can understand Dutch. Um, and so, the, but the thing is that both of them are written differently. And so that's why German and Dutch are considered different languages. The same can be said with a number of Iberian languages. Aragonese and Castilian, modern Spanish, um, are extremely similar, such that a modern Spanish speaker and an Aragonese speaker can understand each other. But they write differently. And every few words will be different. So they are different languages. Now, I put below um, a comparison of three of the most dominant uh, Kurdish uh, languages, so we can see the slight differences uh, between them. The first one is Kurmanji. Kurmanji is spoken by about half of the world's Kurds, and you can see it on the map in the dark green area. So that's the northernmost parts of Iraq into central Turkey. Now, you have the second language, and Kurmanji, because the dominant uh, group of Kurdish speakers who speak it is in Turkey, um, uses the Latin script in order to represent uh, its uh, wording. So those are actually the spellings uh, that are correct. Now, Sorani uh, is the dominant form of Kurdish in central Iraq. And you can see that in the middle shade of green uh, in Iraq that, uh, that crosses over the border into Iran. Um, and that's Sorani. And Sorani is typically written with the Arabic alphabet. So I've written the uh, Sorani below in the uh, correct uh, Arabic styling of, uh, of the script. And above it, I've written a Kurmanji style um, representation of how it would be written if it were written with Latin characters. The most divergent uh, form of Kurdish is what's called Zaza or Zazaki, um, which is those areas in that light purple that are dotted throughout Turkey. As compared to Kurmanji and Sorani, which are closely related to each other, think French and Spanish, Zazaki is a little bit more removed from that. Um, think um, French and Romanian. But so I want to compare the expressions, right? The first one on the left-hand side is welcome. Uh, and so, right, in Kurmanji, it's tu bekher hatiye. In Sorani, it's bikher bi. And in Zazaki, it's ti bekher ame. You can see in almost every case, you have this khair. Khair is the Arabic word for good, which has sort of uh, uh, become part of the Kurdish language. But, and you can see the, the be, right? That precedes the khair, like in goodness. But they're not exactly the same um, in terms of the other pieces that go around that expression. 
The next expression I have is what is your name? Which in Kurmanji is Navete uh, Chie. In Sorani, No Chie. And Zazaki, Namiti Choyo. So there are similars, similarities, right? You have the Ch, you have, they have something with Nam or Na. Um, so it has that, those kinds of similarities. The next two columns are, how old are you? And I don't understand. Um, so those are those linguistic differences. It's also important to talk about the issue of origins. Both the, or, the origins of the Assyrians and the origins of the Kurds are disputed. And when we say the Assyrians, I'm talking about the modern Assyrians um, who live in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and Iran, as well as the diaspora um, today. And so there are two theories of Assyrian um, identity. So the first one, and it's the dominant one held by both Assyrians and the historical community, is the theory of Assyrian continuity. And what this theory of Assyrian continuity really says is that Assyrians today are descended from ancient Assyrians, um, that there is a through line throughout history that connects the people of the ancient city of Ashur with the current population that calls themselves Assyrians. And they argue that when the Assyrian Empire was destroyed, the Assyrian people continued to be alive. They didn't just vanish off the face of the map. There wasn't some kind of genocide. They continued to exist under the rule of different successive empires. And we have different states that exist along the way, like uh, Osroene, like, um, like Adiabene, um, whose rulers are Assyrian or claimed to be Assyrian. And the Assyrian identity crystallizes around the adoption of Christianity um, and the creation of the Church of the East. Um, and once the Church of the East is limited to only the followers in the northern part of Iraq, effectively that creates the ethno religion of the Assyrians. Um, and even within the time of the Church of the East, when it was evangelized outside of uh, northern Iraq, it was evangelized with the understanding that these people were not Assyrians, despite them being members of the Church of the East. Now, this theory has come under direct scrutiny from what's called the Assyrian Annihilation Theory. And the Assyrian Annihilation Theory is a minority theory, but it holds that after the siege of Haran in 609, the ancient Assyrians were eradicated, um, or to the extent that they weren't killed off, they were culturally assimilated to the point where it's useless to call them Assyrians in any meaningful sense of the word. When we have the development of either nationalism in the 19th century or um, or perhaps earlier around the formation of uh, the Church of the East, we have people coming together and creating an, an identity that looks back towards the Assyrians, despite having no meaningful connection to them. So we see these sort of two different perspectives on um, on the, the development and history of the Assyrian people. I'm sort of curious if you can put your comments, um, how do you feel about it? How do you, how do you think different uh, people have analyzed this to come to these kinds of conclusions? Um, how, do you feel like the Assyrian claimed continuity is a legitimate one? Do you believe that the Assyrians were annihilated um, as is claimed um, by the Assyrian annihilation theory?
Um, I have a question about what about DNA? That's a very interesting question. I don't know if DNA would actually be dispositive here. Um, and I mean that in the sense of it would be true regardless of which claim it is. Because if the Assyrians were completely eradicated, okay, we, we would expect the DNA not to match. But if it's the case that the Assyrians survived and were assimilated out of existence, and then that same group of people later converted to Christianity and took on an ethnic identity hearkening back to the ancient Assyrians, we would expect the DNA to be roughly analogous anyway. So I'm not sure that DNA really helps. To the extent that it does, um, Assyrians do, um, as a modern ethnic group, clump very closely together. Um, and I don't know how many Assyrians from ancient history have been recovered and tested. Uh, I have one comment that assimilation in Babylon would be more likely. Um, and I have another comment. I know Assyrians who hold to the continuity theory, but I would be surprised if they weren't eradicated. The Assyrian annihilation theory was the dominant theory in scholarship throughout most of the 19th century until the 20th century when Assyrian continuity became more dominant. Um, and there are a few uh, reasons for this. Um, the shift in scholarship came because of those signposts uh, throughout the post-Assyrian period. The first one is that we see no evidence of a large-scale massacre uh, happening to the Assyrian people. We saw large-scale military defeats, but we didn't. But we don't see anything close to the kind of repopulation that the Assyrians themselves are very are very famous for. The next thing is that we see cult shrines to Ashur, the god of the Assyrians, um, throughout the Neo-Babylonian period, throughout the Parthian uh, and and Seleucid periods. Um, and we even see Assyrian polytheism uh, all the way until the fifth century CE as they're, as they're slowly converting to Christianity. So those things combined uh, have led most scholars to believe that there is a degree of truth uh, to the theory of Assyrian continuity. And to the extent that um, Assyrians didn't exist um, as a fully manifest cultural entity, um, that's something that is more due to them lacking power than because they didn't have uh, such manifestations. In many ways, it could be similar to the development of Judaism in a post Hasmonean dynasty climate, right? Where you have these communities who are existing outside of a political power structure, um, but yet they still retain uh, certain cultural signposts. I have another few comments. Um, if, if the Assyrians were assimilated, they would lose their DNA through intermarriage. Uh, is their language distinct and related to the ancient uh, language? Um, in terms of the ancient Akkadian language, right, we talked about that, um, but the, uh, it's not related. But if we look at the fact that actually through a majority of the latter part of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, the dominant language spoken was Aramaic. And, that's, and that is a direct ancestor to the languages that the Assyrians speak today. Um, there's an argument that 2,700 years ago, Assyrians exiled 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel to Afghanistan, um, uh, known as Beni Israel Pashtun. Um, that, may, that may be the case, but uh, I'm not aware of any scholarly support for that. Um, there's another comment here of, Uh, I don't think uh, Assyrians of today are related to today's group for the simple reason that Nineveh was destroyed by Mitanni and Nebuchadnezzar and, uh, and they feasted on the Assyrians. I believe they left such a dark image in ancient times as terror armies. I don't think they may want to relate to ancient ancestors. There are, there are a few things. The first is that it's the Medes and the Babylonians. Uh, and it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. It was his, it was his father, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, Mitanni was destroyed by this point um, that destroyed Nineveh. But um, 
yes, the, the armies of Assyria um, were incredibly scary, um, but the people themselves that were living on the land, um, in ancient times, you wanted the people to survive. Um, you just didn't want them to rebel uh, because you needed these people to plant crops and, and harvest. Otherwise, you couldn't produce. So for the most part, um, there seems to be no reason to believe that the Medes and the Babylon or the Babylonians would actually eradicate the Assyrians. Then we have the two questions about Kurdish origin, right? Um, the first attested uh, uses of Kurd to describe a group of people um, uh, come from Iranic sources, and those Iranic sources are about 1500 years old, but they're not referring to Kurds as a distinct group. They're using the word Kurt, which in Middle Persian means nomad. So we really don't see Kurds referring to a specific clear ethnic uh, group until about the 800s, 900s CE, um, referring to a number of Persianate speaking peoples in the, in the, in the Jazeera region and uh, the Zagros Mountains um, as a chain, both further north than uh, the Jazeera region and further south. That said, the Kurds argue that their history goes back significantly further uh, than the sources would support. Many of them claim that they come from the Medes. There have been linguistic uh, questions about whether or not uh, the Kurds are descended from the Medes. The Medes definitely did speak an Iranic language, but most linguist, linguistic analysis, uh, sorry, most linguist, linguistic analysts point out that the Median language, to the extent that we have copies of it, um, looks to be from a different branch on the Iranic family tree than is Kurdish, so not a direct ancestor. And the Median Empire um, ceased to exist as an empire um, about a, uh, over a thousand years before those attested uses of Kurd um, in uh, Persian writing around 1500 years ago. So it leaves a lot of questions as to how that transition from Medes to Kurd could have happened if it did happen. Um, that said, it's certainly a huge part of Kurdish identity to stretch their origins back to that beginning um, and see themselves as the descendants of that empire. In many cases, it wasn't until the 20th century that Kurds saw themselves as a singular group, um, a, as a nationalist response to the Turkish nationalism of Turkey and the Persian nationalism of Iran into, uh, and the Arab nationalism of Iraq into which the Kurds necessarily felt estranged. So you have this sort of uh, setup. Now Kurds will also argue that documents from the ancient Greek period, such as Xenophon, will identify uh, groups that have that KRD sound to them, like Korduene, like uh, Korduchoi. Um, and um, there are debates as to whether those are predecessors to a Kurdish state or not. Um, there's a comment that the Medes were assimilated into the Persian identity, and I would argue that that is correct, um, especially when Persia overtook the Medes um, in terms of creating um, the empire of Cyrus the Great. So the scholarly consensus on the origin of the Kurds is that we don't know. Um, they just sort of appear on the map somewhere around the year 900 um, with established states and militaries, um, which of course is not how any group shows up in history. But um, we notice that there's a paucity of sources written by the Kurds themselves until about the 17th century. Um, uh, and so in many cases, Kurds today are trying to figure out what their history is um, 
as opposed to uh, the other peoples in the region that have their own writings. Um, there's a question about whether the Kurds are separate from Persians as an ethnicity. The Kurds are a Persianate ethnicity, meaning that they speak a language that's related to Persian, but it's not Persian. So we have different groups that speak dialects of Persian, and those dialects um, of Persian uh, exist on a continuum, right? You have Farsi in Iran, you have uh, Dari in Afghanistan, you have uh, Tajik in Tajikistan, and all those are dialects of Persian. But then you have languages that are in the Indo-Iranian family tree, but are not Persian themselves, right? And so those are called Persianate languages, things like Kurdish, things like Sogdian, which is an extinct language, um, things like, um, trying to think of it, uh, things like Lurish, um, and other uh, so, uh, and other sorts of languages that are in that sort of group. So to the extent that these Persianate groups uh, exist within a continuum of Persianness, right, that's sort of a question of history. And um, until the Kurds start identifying as Kurds in the 900s, um, we don't see any clear identification that would say that they're not Persian or vice versa. There's another um, question of how true is it that Saladin uh, was a Kurd um, and why was he not fighting for his ethnic group? Um, it seems relatively certain by historical standards of what we know from about a thousand years ago that Saladin was a Kurd. Um, there are uh, groups of people that uh, otherwise try to appropriate him. Uh, he's uh, often appropriated by Arabs because his dominant language was Arabic, which is true. Um, he's often appropriated by Turks because he fought um, alongside a number of different Turkic groups, um, and the majority of his military were Mamluk Turks, which is also true. Um, but he himself was a Kurd. And the question of why he wasn't fighting for his ethnicity is more of a time issue. Um, Kurds and Arabs and Turks and Persians, they didn't fight so much based on ethnic identity as based on loyalties within the group or without the group. And so Saladin was fighting for the Egyptian state because that was the state into which he had been placed in power. And he fought against the Crusaders and against Muslim states um, in the uh, Zengid uh, states, uh, Zengids were Turks, fought against Zengid states in order to unify them under one single Muslim leadership based in Cairo. So that's what he was fighting for. Um, and so the actual ethnic distinctions didn't matter as much. Kurdish nationalism was a direct reaction to the nationalisms surrounding the Kurds that were exclusive of the Kurds. Okay, so I got really ambitious thinking that we could cover all of this in uh, two hours. I don't think that's going to be the case. So I am going to cover the ancient period today and then we'll get to that post-imperial Assyrian period um, tomorrow um, along with uh, how that carries into Ottoman, um, Ottoman uh, Assyria. And that last modern period after 1800 will sort of do um, more, uh, more as we go through the latter half of the 19th century in the Ottoman Empire and uh, the beginning of the 20th century, because the Kurdish-Assyrian relationship um, will be crucial to understanding uh, how um, the events of World War I and the genocides of World War I um, unfolded. Okay, now to sort of break down this timeline, right? The Assyrian Empire in the ancient period existed in three phases. You have the old Assyrian Empire, the middle Assyrian Empire, and the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And the median period exists roughly uh, with the end of the Neo-Assyrian period and the beginning of the post-imperial Assyrian period. The 
So numbers one through three are when Assyrians are actually in political power and numbers uh, four uh, through eight are periods when the Assyrians do not have political power and autonomy. Um, as I pointed out, the Kurds don't have political autonomy um, beyond uh, internal autonomy within the states that they lived in um, outside of uh, outside of the Median period, if you consider the Kurds to be descendants of the Medes. All right, so it's worth actually realizing the difference of what we can be talking about when we're talking about the Assyrian Empire. So when we're talking about the old Assyrian Empire, we're talking about uh, an area within the Jazeera. And you can see the city of Ashur. Uh, you can also see the capitals of Kalhu and Nineveh. Ashur was always the central city of the Assyrians, but it wasn't necessarily the capital. The capital moved several times during the history of Assyria. Nineveh was probably the capital for the longest period of time especially in the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Uh, Kalhu was a capital uh, from time to time. And you can see that the Middle Assyrian Empire, sort of in brown, uh, extended uh, as far south as Babylon and uh, made its way to the Mediterranean by conquering states in what is today Syria. And the Neo-Assyrian Empire, at its greatest extent, even controlled parts of Egypt, uh, and the Southern Levant, uh, as well as all of Mesopotamia. So when we talk about old Assyria, um, the city of Ashur was founded in, uh, in the year 2600 BCE or roughly there. And the city was built on a rocky outcropping on the Northern side of the uh, Greater Zab River and the, its confluence with the Tigris. And you can see that on the map. Um, and so Ashur uh, began to be the center of a number of different city-states. Those city-states uh, fought with each other and eventually came under the control of different monarchs. Now, what's interesting to point out is that we actually have attested evidence uh, from different letters and caches that the Assyrians at this point were in charge of a large trade network. Um, and that trade network extended into the center of Anatolia. You can see the city of Kanesh uh, that I've identified on the map. And the city of Kanesh was what was called the Karum uh, or a city along uh, this path. Um, and the Karums would all have Wabertums or uh, adjutant um, spokes, uh, let's say on the wheel uh, from place to place. And from Ashur to central Anatolia, where the Hatti and the Hittites uh, both lived, um, there would be a large trade route, and it would stop in the various cities uh, along the way, in the various city-states along the way. We know that um, the resources traveled uh, that were traded along this um, were primarily tin from Iran, um, and uh, textiles, especially textiles from Babylon, were very popular. Um, in Anatolia, and they would load these items up on donkeys and bring a sort of that caravan of donkeys all the way to Kanesh. The donkeys themselves would also be sold um, in addition to what they were carrying. In return, um, the Hattians uh, and the Hittites would provide gold and silver that they had mined in, in Anatolia. What's particularly interesting about these trade routes uh, from the ancient period is that they were managed by entrepreneurs. They weren't managed by the king, which is very surprising. In most cases, the uh, political leadership tries to take power uh, in these kinds of situations. But that is not what happened here. And there is a scholarly debate as to why um, the kings of Ashur did not uh, try to impose their will over the trade routes. Some have argued that they actually didn't have the physical power and means to do so, and so they didn't. Others have argued that it was primarily an issue of power concentration. And uh, so since it was outside of the area of Ashur, they couldn't necessarily send their soldiers there effectively. 
And then finally, some say that perhaps the kings recognized that this was working well on its own, and so they didn't feel the need to intervene. But for whatever reason, uh, we end up having these trade routes, and they are spectacularly successful from an economic perspective. We also see um, that Shamsi Adad becomes the first king of Ashur as an empire. Um, and when he does this, he is able to, he comes from uh, Babylon, he is ethnically Amorite. And one of the interesting things is that the Assyrian kings list, which is one of the sources we use to figure out what was going on at this period, uh, and it's a list of the kings and perhaps some of their accomplishments. The Assyrian kings list goes to great pains to try and Assyrify um, Shamshi Adad. Uh, he, they give Shamshi Adad um, an Assyrian lineage, which he doesn't, which seems very fixed uh, and attached to him in a way that doesn't make sense. Shamshi Adad. Um, not only was able to unify Ashur with a number of the other cities in the Jazeera, he was able to attack Mari, which is their neighbor to the west, along the Euphrates River, and was able to successfully conquer Mari and add it to Ashur. When he did this, he became the first uh, Assyrian king to take the title Shar Kishatim. Uh, Shar Kishatim uh, means king, uh, king of the universe. Uh, literally, it means... Uh, king of Kish, uh, but Kish um, was a very important city, and so the title uh, Shar Kishatim uh, came to be known as king of the universe. And this title survived in most Assyrian, uh, among most Assyrian kings, and it became integrated into the religious traditions of other peoples in the region, um, including the Jews who use this uh, term to refer to their god. Now, we also have uh, this being the first time that a real census was taken of the population, uh, so that way they could be organized uh, into military units. So Shamshi Adad uh, also began the parceling of Ashur into provinces, um, and those provinces were further helped by the census so that he could assign governors to the same or roughly the same amount of population, regardless of size and territory. This created a new level of government within the Assyrian power structure, because originally Shamshi Adad had inherited a complete and absolute monarchy. But the creation of these provinces created a new level of nobility who now had a say in the affairs of state. That said, their say was very weak and would amplify only over many, many centuries. When Shamshi Adad died, he left a power vacuum into which no Assyrian king was really capable of taking the same degree of power. And so that vacuum allowed the Babylonians to reassert their uh, independence and power under their own Amorite king, Hammurabi. Uh, Hammurabi, of course, is famous for receiving, uh, according to him, from the god Shamash, uh, the god of the sun, uh, his code of laws. And you can see this fingernail from the uh, Hammurabi code Stella. Hammurabi is on the left, um, Shamash the god is seated, right? And Shamash the god is presenting Hammurabi with his code of laws. It's worth pointing out that the laws that Hammurabi accepts are actually relatively complicated. Um, there are some like eye for an eye, which is relatively straightforward, but there are others um, that require witnesses and re could require testimony and provide different punishments in the case of different evidentiary standards. Um, and in Hammurabi's code, we can see the basis of several different kinds of law. We can see some kinds of property law, we can see some kinds of tort law, and we can see some kinds of contract law, as well as criminal punishments. As we move away from uh, old Assyria, and we get to Middle Assyria, which sees a great change in the way that Assyria projects power. The primary thing is the creation of the military. Now, we talked about with Shamshi Adad, the creation of uh, governors 
and those governors having a say uh, in the administration of policy, that becomes codified by the Middle Assyrian period, whereby individuals that had done well in battle would be rewarded with governorships. And so the military uh, created this sort of feudal state architecture that existed over the top of uh, the general farming and subsistence agriculture that most Assyrians were engaged in. At the beginning of the Middle Assyrian period, there were three dominant powers in the world. They called themselves the great powers and would address each other as brother. And those are the Egyptians, the uh, Hatti, or our Hittites, um, and the Babylonians. And these three powers would require the submission of all the other city-states in their, in their vicinity. And we know this degree of diplomatic uh, information because of the Tel Amarna letters. Now, Tel Amarna, is, Tel is an archeological mound and it's in the Egyptian city of Amarna. So that's how it got its name. And these letters are all written in Akkadian, Akkadian being the language of diplomacy uh, in the Middle East, regardless of what, what the national languages were of the various uh, peoples. And in these letters, we see negotiations over territory. We see the forced capitulation of smaller kingdoms and the slow and gradual recognition of um, Assyria as a great power along with these other four, uh, with these other three great powers. In particular, we have um, Adad Nirari I, who really inaugurates this period. And he uh, begins the invasion of Mitanni, uh, which is concluded by Shalmaneser I. This invasion of Mitanni completely destroys it and leads to the annexation of all of the historic Mitanni lands to Ashur, if you remember, uh, to Assyria. If you remember from that earlier map, this is that projection to the coastline was the conquest of Mitanni. And the defeat of Mitanni um, made it clear to the other three great powers that Assyria was a rising great power. We also have, you can see that uh, Amarna letter uh, was written by uh, Asher Ubalit, uh, the first to Akhenaten, um, and it was concerning a number of the states in the Levant region, because those were states that were in direct competition between Assyria's uh, area of, um, of vassals and Egypt's area of vassals. So, while there's no clear break between the old Assyrian Empire and the middle Assyrian Empire, except for these internal changes in governance that themselves took centuries to unfold, there is a clear break between the middle Assyrian and neo-Assyrian empires. And that clear break comes at the hands of the Sea Peoples and the Arameans. Now the Sea Peoples are a historical controversy. We don't know exactly where they came from or what they were. The general uh, consensus is that they came from either Greece or uh, or from islands near to Greece. And these sea peoples uh, launched a number of invasions. They, uh, they invaded Crete and they invaded Egypt and a number of the Levantine states. Now, given that the Middle Assyrian Empire had minimal exposure uh, directly to the Mediterranean, the effect of the Sea Peoples on the Assyrians was significantly lighter than it was on the other civilizations. The Egyptians nearly collapsed, several of the Levantine civilizations collapsed, um, and the civilization on Crete also collapsed from the invasions of the Sea Peoples. That said, Assyria had its own set of invasions, and those invasions are from the Arameans. The people of Aram come from what's today the area near Damascus, and from there they launched a number of invasions against Assyria. The Arameans themselves don't write about what happened, but we can tell what happened by reading through the reading through the lines of what the Assyrians claimed about it. You can see, for example, King Tiglath Pileser the um, first wrote in his terracotta octagon um, that he was sending. Uh, forces 
uh, to battle the Arameans in a number of different cities. Now, if we if we just take that at face value, um, it looks like the Assyrians are winning. Ne at nearly every engagement, uh, according to the Stella, um, the Assyrians are victorious. They take their enemies uh, and smite them. But it leaves open the question, why would you have to keep sending uh, troops out to battle if you keep winning? And of course, the answer is they didn't. Um, the Arameans uh, were more and more successful and even were able to sack the city of Nineveh, um, the capital city of the Assyrians, sometime in the 11th century. The Arameans also uh, managed to populate themselves throughout the Assyrian world and are part of the reason why common people in Assyria began to switch from the Aramaic of the Arameans, um, sorry, from the Assyrian dialect of Akkadian to the Aramean dialect of the, Ar the Aramaic dialect of the Arameans um, as their common language. And in fact, that would persist uh, throughout the remainder of Assyrian history. It's worth pointing out at, uh, at this point, because um, we saw this on the flip side, as we move into the Neo-Assyrian period, we have Queen uh, Shamuramat. And Queen Shamuramat um, was unique uh, in Assyrian history for ruling uh, in her own name, uh, her own regnal name as a queen. And she was in power for five years while uh, her son was too young uh, to rule and his father had already died. That said, uh, Shamura Mat was incredibly gifted as a military commander and strategist. Uh, you can see this is the Stella of Pazarjik, um, and this Stella commemorates her victory against uh, the Komur, which was a city-state um, north of Assyria and south of Urartu. We're gonna talk a little bit about Urartu in a second. And we can see the crossover here between uh, Shamuramat uh, and the foundational myths of the Armenians that we talked about in, in uh, presentation 22. In that situation, we were following King Ara. King Ara, of course, was the first mythological king of Urartu, and he had his queen Nevard. Um, he was addressed by uh, the emissary of Queen Semiramis, uh, of uh, of the Assyrians, Semiramis is believed to be the mythological equivalent of Shamuramat, and uh, in the Assyrian, uh, sorry, in the Armenian tale, uh, Semiramis is magical, uh, and she is able uh, to perform numerous spells, and which is how she's able to prevail on the battlefield. When King uh, Ara refuses to divorce his queen, uh, to take Semiramis as his queen. Uh, Semiramis declares war on, on uh, him and on the kingdom of Urartu. Semiramis is able to win, but it's a Pyrrhic victory because in the middle of the battle, she slays, uh, well, her troops slay King Ara. And so she uses her magical witchcraft to bring him back to life to be her lover. Uh, King Ara is not terribly excited by this, um, but that is the Armenian story. From the Assyrian side, um, there is no such mythological relationship. Uh, but there are numerous cases of, of Queen Shamuramat moving against vassal states of Urartu to bring them into vassalage of Assyria. So we move into the Neo-Assyrian period and the Neo-Assyrian period sees this rivalry develop between the Assyrian empire and Urartu. You can see Urartu on the map. Uh, it is in the Assyrian highlands uh, around uh, the area of Lake Vaughan with their capital at Tushpa. Now, um, the Assyrians uh, lead a number of attacks against uh, Urartu, starting with those of Shalmaneser III in 859. Um, Shalmaneser is not able to uh, defeat the Urartuans, and they are in turn able to expand and take a number of territories. But we have uh, a number of campaigns led by uh, 
leaders after Shalmaneser III. Now, there are kings that follow him, but these kings are generally weak in terms of their ability to govern uh, their ability to govern the military and to orchestrate it, which led to a number of Turtanu, or commanders in chief, um, effectively becoming rulers in their own name. One of the most successful was Shamshi uh, Shamshi Ilu. You can see um, a modern man dressed as Shamshi Ilu would have. Uh, and in 780 BC, uh, he actually wrote his own stela in his own name that he had fought against King Argishti I of, Ur of Urartu, the builder of Erebuni, Erebuni being the modern Armenian city of Yerevan. Um, and he defeated Argishti on the battlefield and he claimed spoils from that war with the Urartuans. Um, None of the other uh, Turtanu ever claimed victory in their own name. That would be reserved for the king, uh, who had the blessings of the god Ashur um, to invoke uh, those victories. Now, the fact that, uh, sorry, after uh, Shamshi Ilu um, passed, you began to have more concentrated and effective rulers um, who were uh, ruling in Assyria. Probably the most famous is Tiglath-Pileser. Um, and Tiglath-Pileser III um, fought a number of wars expanding Assyrian power uh, in the Levant region and against Urartu. But in particular, in the Levant region, he went all the way down uh, to the east bank of the Jordan River, and he was able to take a number of the territories in what's now northern Lebanon and northern Syria, uh, banishing uh, those populations through the first of many internal deportations within the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were quite direct about their policy of internal deportations and write about it in their own annals and biographies. We have, though, Urartuans, uh, we have situations where Urartuans actually win a few victories as well. Uh, Sarduri, the second of Urartu, won key victories against uh, uh, Assyria on their border region. And so it was very clear that the Neo Assyrian Empire would need to uh, deal with Urartu, uh, but, such, but it wasn't going to be an easy removal for, uh, of them from power. Now, just a small, uh, just to remem remi remember, uh, yeah. remember, um, Urartu actually engaged in a lot of trade with Assyria as well in between these, uh, in between these wars, and that's because they possessed a lot of things that Assyria lacked and needed desperately. Um, Assyria, uh, Urartu, as a mountainous uh, region, had numerous uh, copper and uh, and other mines. Uh, for precious metals and stones. Urartu also bred horses and uh, exported uh, unwoven uh, cloth um, and, and wool uh, for weaving. In contrast, the Assyrians would provide finished goods um, for Urartuan consumption and, fash and also fashion weapons and smelt them. We then have the reigns of Shalmaneser V and Sharukin II, also known as Sargon II. Now, Shalmaneser V um, begins a siege against the city of Samaria uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel. And so we have uh, attestations of this war that come to us from both uh, Assyrian annals and from uh, the Jewish writings from the time, which of course are uh, compiled in the Bible. Now, um, the city of Samaria uh, was besieged for three years, uh, starting with Shalmaneser V. During that period though, Shadokian actually uh, came to power under very mysterious circumstances. Many historians believe that Shadokian actually launched a coup d'etat and removed Shalmaneser V 
effectively being a usurper and starting his own dynasty of Assyrian rulers. Whatever the succession uh, situation was, Shadokin was more than happy to take uh, credit for the successful conquest of the kingdom of Israel and the deportation of its population. Interestingly, the Jewish uh, sources and the Assyrian sources agree that roughly 30,000 people were deported um, and the extent of the victory and humiliation that the Assyrians imposed uh, on these conquered territories. Shadokin um, redivided the empire. It had previously had 12 uh, provinces and that had been a stable number since the days of Shamshi Adad. Uh, he, he doubled that and then some in terms of creating new provinces and weakening the power of every constituent province. But uh, the new Assyrian province of Israel uh, would be ruled by an Assyrian governor and uh, bring tribute before Assyria. That said, the conquest of Israel did not uh, pacify the region entirely. Um, further to the south and west, uh, a number of city-states along the coast, such as Ashdod, uh, such as Gaza, um, rebelled against uh, Shadokin and tried to get the Egyptians to support them, the Egyptians being ruled by their pharaoh, uh, Shabaka of Nubia. The battle did not go well for the Egyptian um, Levantine coalition, and the Assyrians um, demanded that Shabaka um, hand to him in fetters the rebellious kings, which uh, Shabaka did in order to prevent further uh, fights uh, with uh, with Shadokin and uh, and the Assyrians. Historians are unclear as to whether the Assyrian goal prior to this Egyptian intervention into Levantine affairs, um, if the Assyrians actually wanted to conquer Egypt. There doesn't seem to be anything in any of the diplomatic correspondence that we found that indicates some sort of destiny that Egypt should come under Assyrian rule or anything similar. Um, and even Shadokin II himself, once he had gotten those leaders from the Levant in chains uh, in his custody, he made peace with the Egyptians and didn't invade their territory. Shadokin II, however, um, didn't just... Um, Okay, uh, didn't just attack uh, Israel. Uh, he also attacked the Urartuans. In particularly, he attacked the city of Musasir. And Musasir, as we pointed out, um, was a, uh, on the Armenian side, was a city-state in close alliance with Urartu. Um, and it was in Musasir that the holiest place in the Urartuan world was, which was the Temple of Khaldi. Khaldi being the chief god of the Urartuans. Now, this sack of Musasir um, was a direct confrontation between Sargon II of Assyria and King Rusa of the uh, Urartuans, resulting in an incredible victory for uh, Shadokin II and a, and a signing of vassalage of Urartu itself uh, to Assyria. Shadokin II also decided to create his own new capital city um, called Dar Shadokin, literally the house of Shadokin. And uh, you can see this is actually a stella from the wall of that palace. Um, he is, as far as I'm aware, the only Assyrian king who created his own capital city from nothing, as opposed to simply moving the capital from one of the cities that already existed in the Assyrian empire to one of the others. Now, one of the other things to point out is that prior to the sack of Musasir, you had a number of battles between Urartuans and the Assyrians over these vassal states. So you can see just below that red circle is Manai. And Manai was a confederation of different tribes 
in what's now northwestern Iran that had pledged historic loyalty to Urartu, and so Assyria invaded them to bring them into vassalage to Assyria. While that war in Manai was going on, um, Sharukin II um, paid very close attention to what was happening just to the east as the Medes were bringing together their own confederacy. And so it's worth talking about um, the Median leader, uh, De uh, Yokes. Um, De Yokes is a Greek name. It's probably derived from the Persian Dahiyalku. Um, but the problem is, is that he's not attested in any source other than Greek sources. So it's unclear whether or not he even lived. And it may be the case that it's an association between his putative son and him. Regardless, um, within Median history, uh, it's useful to use him as a reference um, because we have nothing else to put in that uh, placeholder. So the Medes traditionally lived in the northwestern part of Iran. You can see in the lower right-hand side um, the territories that they would historically occupy. And the Medes were a number of Persianate uh, tribes, right? Their language was not Persian. It was not a dialect of Persian. It was its own language, but within that Indo-Iranian family. It's unclear whether uh, Deyokis was able to unite the uh, Median tribes primarily through warfare or through diplomacy. He definitely used both in his arsenal, um, but he was able to unite them and decided to create a capital called Hagmatana. Hagmatana became rendered in the Greek as Ekbatana, um, and that became the capital city of the Median state. Hagmatana, of course, has uh, come into modern Persian as Hamadan, uh, and you can see the ruins of Hakmatana uh, just outside of the modern per, uh, Iranian city of Hamadan. The Median tribes now as a unified coalition um, were a much bigger threat to Assyria than those individual tribes had been. But the manifestation of that will come later. If we look to the West after the death of Shadokin II, we have the ascension of Sennacherib. Um, and Sennacherib um, is one of the most important Assyrian kings. Um, he was responsible for form, uh, creating many numerous formations, or at least documenting their use. Uh, we can see the use of siege engines uh, when he besieged the city of Lachish which was a Judean city um, in 701 BCE. And Sennacherib was increasing the power of Assyria um, in order to compel, uh, he had previously compelled the Judean king, Hezekiah, um, uh, the Judean king, Hezekiah. Um, he pre yeah, sorry. Yeah, he'd previously compelled the king, uh, Judean king Hezekiah to pay tribute, but he hadn't forcibly annexed those territories. Um, king Hezekiah um, decided to revolt um, and did so with the support of the Egyptians. In this case, similar to the previous case, the Egyptians were trying to support um, their own, uh, uh, sorry, uh, their own vassals in the Levant uh, against Assyria. Now, it's unclear what the Egyptian uh, reason for these kinds of interventions was. Um, the Assyrians hadn't directly attacked Egypt since, um, since that uh, battle against uh, Shibitku. Um, sorry, that battle against Shibitku uh, over 20 years earlier. But um, it's, it's theorized that the Egyptians wanted a buffer region between themselves and Assyria to keep themselves safe. And so uh, Sennacherib gave battle uh, at, outside of the city of El Teke against the Egyptian forces. And it was disastrous for the Egyptians, led by Crown Prince Taharqa of Nubia. 
Now, it may sound confusing that Taharqa is a Nubian if we're talking about Egyptian forces. And this is because Egypt, Egypt at this point is in the 25th dynasty. And the 25th dynasty of Egypt was actually not an ethnic Egyptian dynasty. It was after Egypt had been conquered by Nubia. And so these were Nubian kings ruling over Egypt. Um, and so the leaders in this period are black Africans. Uh, Taharqa, um, after losing at El Teke, um, does a retreat and basically leaves Hezekiah to the will of Sennacherib. The Jewish sources and the Assyrian sources agree that most of the major cities of Judah were besieged, plundered, and razed. Uh, Lachish being the second largest city uh, in Judah after Jerusalem, um, which was certainly subject to this. And we can see the Assyrian wall reliefs uh, showing how effectively they destroyed the city. That said, the city of Jerusalem was not taken. And there are differing um, reasons between the Jewish sources and the Assyrian sources as for why that happened. The Jewish sources credit a plague that was God's will. And the Assyrian sources credit Hezekiah paying the tribute that he was expected to pay um, and believing that leaving him like a bird caged in his castle was enough uh, to deal with this underlying problem. So after the destruction of, uh, of the Judean monarchy and leaving it uh, basically in its very weakened position, Sennacherib returned home uh, to Assyria and ruled there for um, quite a while before actually being assassinated uh, by two of his sons. Following that assassination, following that assassination, we have a short civil war between the various brothers as to whom will as to who will follow um, Sennacherib as ruler of the Assyrian Empire, and the leader, uh, the the what the the victor in that struggle was one of um, Sennacherib's younger children, Esarhaddon. Esarhaddon. Um, was very unique as concerns uh, the Assyrian rulers for a few reasons. The first one is that he had a deep distrust of the men in his family, considering the fact that his father was murdered by two of his half brothers. Um, and so he trusted women in the court far more than he trusted many of the men in the court, including his mother, Nakaya. And you can see Nakaya she's one of the few Assyrian women who's ever been represented in Stella and probably the most powerful Assyrian woman in the history of ancient Assyria. She wrote uh, one treaty in her own name. She was also uh, able to commission reports and lead troops in battle. So we also see that uh, Asarhadon um, looked after one of the other things that his father had done, which is that his father, Sennacherib, had entered Babylon and despoiled the city, uh, taking away a significant amount of its treasure and raising parts of it to the ground. Asarhadon did the opposite. He restored Babylon. And there are a number of different Stella and Cartouche celebrating Asarhadon's investment in Babylon. The reason for such investment was based on the legitimacy of the Assyrian state. There had all, Babylon had always been seen as the sister uh, to Assyria um, and one of its cultural progenitors. And so the restoration of, of Babylon was seen as a recreation and reinvestment of Assyrian legitimacy. We also have Asarhaddon leading two different invasions of Egypt. The first one is in 674 BC, and Taharqa, who had now gone from crown prince to pharaoh of Egypt, Taharqa repelled that one effectively. 
There was a second invasion in 671, which resulted in the capture of Memphis, the capital city of the Egyptians, by Asarhaddon. Asarhaddon captured a number of different Egyptian potentates um, and took them in fetters to uh, Ashur. For a reason that's not entirely clear, he pardoned one of them, uh, uh, Nekau, um, and sent Nekau back to Egypt to serve as an Assyrian governor and vassal king. In fact, this Neko becomes Neko I, the founder of the 26th Egyptian dynasty and the first Egyptian dynasty um, after the Nubians to be of ethnic Egyptian descent. We then have Asarhaddon succeeded by his son, Ashurbanipal. And Ashurbanipal um, was probably the highlight of the Assyrian leadership, really the, the apex of their power and control. Egypt uh, rebelled twice during his reign. Uh, once was led by Taharqa, trying to reassert authority uh, coming from the south, and it was defeated. And the other was by Taharqa's successor. Now, we know that Asarhaddon had fought with Taharqa and wounded him critically, which may explain why Ashurbanipal was able to put, a, put him away for good. Taharqa's successor, Atantamani, um, killed Neko I and tried to reassert uh, Nubian rule over Egypt, and Ashurbanipal uh, took his forces down to Egypt uh, in 664 uh, to the city of Thebes and sacked it. Uh, as a permanent reminder to the Egyptians that they should be under Assyrian vassalage. Ashurbanipal himself was known for emphasizing his brute strength. And you can see in, uh, in this uh, fresco that he is wrestling a lion. Um, of course, as part of his wider lion hunting um, uh, frescoes, um, and it shows the immense power that he was believed to have wielded on behalf of the god Ashur. One of the things that's worth pointing out, however, is that after Asarhaddon uh, had revitalized Baghdad, the governor of Baghdad became an, a, a very uh, vaunted position, second only uh, in power to the uh, king of Assyria himself. And so uh, Shamshi, uh, sh sorry, Shama Shuma Ukin um, became uh, the king of Baghdad, a subservient king to the king of Assyria. However, in 652, uh, Shama Shuma Ukin um, was tired of the way that Ashurbanipal was checking every move that he made um, and really micromanaging his rule over Babylon. And so he revolted, leading to a civil war within the Assyrian Empire that lasted for four years. You can see on the right, this is, a, this is part of a relief that shows Ashurbanipal's victory over Shamashuma Ukin, his brother, and uh, his reincorporation of Babylon uh, on, into direct Assyrian governance. Nineveh during the period of Ashurbanipal was an a beautiful and intimidating city. You can see the palaces all along the Tigris River. Uh, and this is how it's imagined that it would have looked. Um, you can also see uh, the internal palaces of Assyria. Uh, and when diplomats would come, they would be greeted by the Lamasu, which are those mythical half man, half horse uh, winged creatures. Um, that's, uh, sorry, half man, half lion, Half uh, yeah, half lion, half man, half eagle, too many halves. But um, those creatures would intimidate uh, those people who came to the court of Ashur and remind them what place they were in. Ashurbanipal, in particular, was a very literate person, and he assembled his own library of numerous texts that um, were collected from all over the empire and represented all different kinds of information that could be of use to the Assyrian Empire. 
And so by the end of Ashurbanipal's rule, the Assyrian Empire looked like this. Those green areas are what are called pahitu, uh, or uh, provinces of the empire. You also had a number of countries that are in sort of a yellow green color, and those are tributary states. As you can see, Judah is a tributary state, so is Egypt, so is Urartu, so is Elam. Cyprus itself was divided among a number of different uh, city kingdoms. And Babylon, as I mentioned, had its own sort of rulership. At this point, Assyria was effectively the unchallenged ruler of the Middle East. And it's worth pointing out that the Assyrians um, made many uh, notable achievements in the creation of their empire. Some of them are relatively simple, like keys and locks. Um, others are more complicated. They developed plumbing and in including toilets that could flush. Um, they also developed aqueducts, the first aqueducts in use. In fact, um, the Assyrian aqueduct was in use until 1996. Um, they were the first ones to make libraries and they determined how to de uh, destroy walls by digging below them to uh, destabilize them. But probably the most important aspect of the Assyrian rule is that it really unified the Middle East culturally. Um, you had the formal use of Aramaic uh, throughout the Middle East uh, because of the Assyrian power. You also had um, common uh, theologies through much of uh, Mesopotamia and the Levant region as a result of Assyria. And you had uh, the development of roads to connect all the different regions together. But after Ashurbanipal's death, there became a number of civil wars that weakened the power of the Assyrian empire. And conversely, the states around Assyria began to become more powerful. Babylonia led by Nabopolassar, uh, who you can see on the right-hand side, revolted against the Assyrians. And they were joined uh, as, uh, by allies, the Medes. The Medes were led by their king, uh, um, who's known by the Persian name uh, Uvachstra. And Kuachares and Nabopolassar um, made an anti-Assyrian um, coalition and were actually devastatingly effective against the Assyrians. They started a war in the 620s uh, BC. And by 614, they had already besieged and uh, the Medes had already besieged and taken the city of Ashur. In 612, Nineveh itself was sacked. And that meant that the Assyrian Empire was on the run. In fact, Ashur Ubalit II who should have been coronated in the temple of Ashur never got the chance. And so he was crown prince through much of this later period. After the sack of Nineveh, uh, the Assyrians retreated into the Taurus mountains, into the, to the city of Haran, which they established as their new capital city. On, uh, when the Medes and the Babylonians were approaching the city, um, uh, Asher Ubalit II was afraid that they would take it. And so he retreated with a number of his best troops to Karchemish, further to the west. The Medes and the Babylonians did take the city. And the final gasp of breath for the Assyrian Empire was Asher Ubalit II besieging his own capital city to try and take it back from the Median. Uh, Babylonian coalition. He did not succeed, and in 609, he was cut down along with the rest of his Assyrian troops. During the same time, the Medes 
uh, put a significant amount of pressure on Urartu. And so uh, Urartu also fell. Ironically, uh, Urartu, which had been the Assyrians' greatest enemy throughout the, seven, uh, throughout the 8th century BC, um, fought side by side with the Assyrians during the fall of the uh, uh, Neo-Assyrian Empire. And finally, we get to the Battle of Carchemish. So the Egyptian vassals that were loyal to Assyria remained loyal, um, perhaps we could say even stupidly so, um, because by 609, Assyria had uh, failed, uh, was no longer existing, but Necho II of Egypt um, sent uh, a military uh, caravan to the city of Carchemish to meet with um, some remaining Assyrian soldiers. He passed through the Judean kingdom ruled by Josiah, which itself had risen up against the Assyrians. Um, but it also turned around and fought the Egyptians. We even have a Stella, uh, sorry, we even have a letter from Necho II uh, addressed to Josiah saying, I did not come to battle you this day, wondering why Josiah, who um, was generally speaking, uh, willing to live within the Assyrian parameters, uh, as long as he had a, a greater degree of autonomy, uh, would fight him. Nevertheless, Josiah's forces were completely routed by Necho, and Necho made his way to Carchemish. Carchemish, however, was devastating for the Egyptians. In 605, Nabopolassar gave battle, and he destroyed the entire Egyptian force to a man. Um, the sources indicate that the Egyptian force was annihilated at the battle. And so this put dead in its tracks the, Assyri the Egyptian attempt to create an Assyrian vassal state um, using those remaining Assyrian soldiers as their vanguard. And so this sets up a post-Assyrian world where the Medes and the Assyrians, um, sorry, the Medes and the, and the Babylonians uh, basically control most of the Middle East. Um, and the Egyptians um, are existing in an antagonistic relationship with the Babylonians. Uh, questions, comments, concerns? All right, uh, if there are no questions or curiosities, um, I think we can close this out. Thank you everybody for, uh, for coming out and uh, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I'm next week we're going to continue uh, telling this story, uh, moving into the post um, Assyrian period and how Assyrians manifested uh, their ethnic identity and religious identity in those periods, as well as covering uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, getting from that point up to uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, and it, the way that the Levant was ruled under them, sorry, the uh, Mesopotamia was ruled by them, as well as stopping along the way to talk about different Kurdish dynasties that occurred during this period. Um, so the Assyrians will continue next week. It's not labeled as an Assyrian lecture, it's labeled as the Ottoman uh, Levant and Mesopotamia, but we will continue from Assyria and go into the uh, Ottoman Levant and Mesopotamia uh, when we get to that point. And it's the same time. It's 7 p.m. Eastern time um, on Thursday night. Um, if you're part of the New York uh, meetup group, uh, Lund uh, New York meetup group, or the um, History Mostly Ancient group, you should see that meetup uh, event already listed. All right, so see everybody next week, bye.